Aren't you grateful for a living hope? <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't living, what kind of hope would it be, huh? You know, we're in this series uh, out of the story of the book of Exodus, titled The Road Out, and it's all about being set free, right? And how the Lord sets us free from things that have hindered our lives. And we do have a God who set us free, and he is our living hope, and yet sometimes, right, certain things entangle us that are hard to let go of. It's where we live. So we're talking about that. It's good to be with you this morning. I always look forward to coming and being with you. Greetings from the Matsu Valley. Yeah. Where no one wears masks. <laughs> and apparently it is spiking now, so... If you're joining us online, if you're, especially if you're from the Tukatnu congregation, the campus there, man, it's good to be with you. I look forward to being with you personally sometime soon. And if you're joining us online, but you're not a part of any of our campuses, thanks for being here. Uh, you're joining us in this series called The Road Out. And I'm sure every single one of us has a road trip story. Mine involves moving my entire family 4,000 miles from Little Rock, Arkansas to Anchorage, Alaska. It was in June of 2000, and the plan was that I was going to take two trips. I'd drive the U-Haul, pulling a trailer, up the Alcan, just me and the dog, get everything moved into the house, catch a good night's sleep, jump on a plane, fly back to Little Rock, and then drive the 4,000 miles again, taking our time to enjoy the sights with all five of our children. We anticipated the trip for months. We planned our stops. We got walkie-talkies so you could communicate between the cars, right? Kathy was really looking forward to the second trip because it was an adventure with the whole family. And of course, Kathy's an Alaska girl. She was born up here. She was moving home. Arkansas had never really felt like home to my Alaska girl. Me, me, I wasn't so much looking forward to the second trip. It was the first trip I was looking forward to. Just me and the dog. <laughs> the quiet. I was between jobs, so I had no responsibility at one job and not any yet at the new one, right? So we're just traveling. All I had to do was keep it between the lines. My plan was to drive to Seattle, pick up one of my best friends, then we were going to hit the Alcan and come up with an adventure, a new season, the freedom of the road, no pressure. I figured we could be up here in a week from Little Rock. That's pushing it, but it can be done, and we did it. But the trip didn't turn out the way I had imagined it. We made it here in six days, but very little went the way I hoped it would. Why? Because of the realities of the road. You know, Murphy loves the road. We weren't five miles out of Little Rock, the dog and me, when the trailer had a flat, and I had to sit by the side of the road and wait for U-Haul to come and fix it. Traffic was horrible. Anytime you got anywhere near a city, and when you're not used to it, driving a 26-foot truck, dragging a 12-foot trailer, that's no piece of cake. It's no fun. The truck broke down in Boise, and I was stuck there for a day and a half. The frost heaves through Canada and Alaska, that was a new experience of discomfort, especially in one of those big old trucks. You know, you look at that kind of thing. The Canadian Mounties at the border gave me a hard time. They just couldn't believe that an American didn't have a handgun in all of that luggage. And then there was 4,000 miles stuck in the cab with a flatulent dog. <laughs> and about the time I got to Anchorage, then I had to jump on a plane, go all the way back, do it all again with my wife, her mother, her mother, three pre-adolescent children who didn't want to move, a two-year-old and a brand new baby. There were times I wondered if I shouldn't have just stayed in Arkansas. You know, we all like adventure, but we're seldom really ready for the realities of the road. And if that's true in the 21st century, with all the comfort of modern travel technology, what do you think it probably was like in the Exodus? 
600,000 men, plus the women and children, all the livestock, all the possessions, on foot in a desert. I'm having a hard time with this. What do you want me to do? Okay, just going to shut this off. Turn that, one on. Turn that one on. I don't know if I don't know if I can do this without both hands free. They're facing a desert they knew nothing about. They're following a leader that they didn't really know. He didn't know where they were going, how long it would take them, what they were going to eat, what they were going to drink along the way, how they and their families were going to even survive the journey. He didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of that. All they had was a promise from this guy who had done some miracles and claimed that he'd met with God. A God that they had heard about but probably never seen. Israel had been liberated from a life of slavery. It was a miraculous adventure. Now what? Now they faced a wilderness and the realities of the road. Now, probably none of us have ever been slaves in a foreign land. But the story of the Exodus is our story. You see, every single one of us was born into a twisted world that exploits and uses people. And we were born under the control of an evil master who rules the air and rules the earth, and he loves destruction and death. And maybe he doesn't whip us with cords, but he's constantly leading us into things that steal our life away, even though we're free. See, life is a gift from the gracious hand of God. But we're bent so that we don't want it that way. We want to strive for it, toil, press to make a life for ourselves. But in the end, we know it's futile and empty. See, trying to find life without the grace of God is like trying to make bricks without straw. It just doesn't hold up. But through faith in Jesus Christ, God liberates us from the slavery and he leads us into life. But you know, life in Christ, it's not easy. I mean, we have been freed, but not fully, right? Because we still live in a broken world. So we live between the already and the not yet. We still live in a world that exploits and uses people. And we've learned ways to survive in that world. Now we stand staring into a wilderness that we don't really know much about. It looks like a desert. How do you live in this reality as a follower of Christ in a fallen world? And to top that off, the evil master whom we've served, many of us inadvertently, some of us probably intentionally, he doesn't want to let us go that easy, does he? He keeps calling us back into things that enslaved us before so we might be enslaved again. Because he can't take our soul, but he can take our freedom. The road that Israel was on 4,000 years ago is the same road that we're on today. The realities of the road are the same. It's just the time and the scenery that's changed. So let's talk about those realities a little bit. As we look at this story, the first reality I see is that the road out is always a road to somewhere. It's always leading somewhere. It's not just out, it's also toward. And if we can't simply, you know, we can't simply be freed from our sin and slavery, we have to be freed for something. We have to have a vision for where God is taking us. And the people of Israel needed that vision so badly. So one of the first things that Moses did, once there was some semblance of order and organization among the people of Israel, is he led them to the place where he had met with God prior to coming to Egypt. That's recorded in chapter 19 of the Exodus, beginning in verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you 
on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do you see the destination of the road? You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You know, I think often we think of the spiritual road as a road to the promised land. We think of a paradise filled with milk and honey or heaven. But that's just a place. It's just a place. The road out of slavery is a call to purpose, not place. It's a call to purpose, a reason for living. God has called us into freedom just as he called these people, not so that we would not belong to anybody, but so we'd belong to him. See what I mean? Everybody got to serve somebody. And God called us to be his people. He didn't call us so that we'd be free to live any way we wanted to live. He called us so that we would be his representatives. It says, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Holy is a word which means uncommon, unlike any other people. See, priests are representatives. That's what a priest does. They represent God to the people, and they represent the people to God. Priests build bridges between God and people, constantly interceding for people and constantly revealing the nature of God. And the promise in this passage is just a restatement of what God had told Abraham way back in Genesis 12. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And I will bless you, and you will what? You'll be a blessing to all the nations. It's a call to purpose. And they were, they were doing that 400 years earlier when they entered Egypt. Joseph went into Egypt. Israel was a blessing to the nation. They prospered there, and so did the Egyptians. But then a wicked Pharaoh arose who rejected the blessing of God, and behind him was that determined enemy of God and of God's people. In every age, Satan himself, the master of lies. And Israel, by the time we meet them in the Exodus, has been so brutally abused that they've lost their purpose or their reason for being. And the road out for them was a return to their identity as the people of God, the possession that he treasures, priests, to be a blessing to all the nations. Our freedom in Christ has the same purpose. That's why he's redeemed us, that we would be a blessing to the nations. And if we forget that, we get our eyes off of that purpose, life in the wilderness is senseless, isn't it? It has no real meaning. We get selfish, self-absorbed. We don't have a purpose. We get discouraged, dissatisfied, angry, and tired. And then we're not a blessing to anybody, are we? We start arguing, we start fighting, we start accusing, we do all those kinds of things. Followers of Christ, all because we got our eyes off the ball, which is God has called us to be a blessing to all people. What would happen if every morning you got up in the morning and the first thing you thought, you, you disciplined yourself. The very first thing you said every morning was, God, I'm your person. I'm your representative. I'm a priest. I bridge the gap between you and a hurting world. That's what I do. I am called to be a blessing. Make me a blessing today. How would it change if when you went to work in the morning, you imagined over the door, going into your place of employment, a sign that said, I am called to be a blessing here today. If every time you approached your family, you said, God has called me to be a blessing to my wife, my husband, and these kids. You think that'd change anything? Because once we embrace that calling as the reason for our release, 
even the harsh wilderness seems like a wonderful place. Second reality, road out can be a school of life for us if we let it. There are four essential things that God used it to teach the Israelites. He wants to teach us as well. First is, we have to learn to trust gratefully. We can learn to trust. One of the first lessons he tried to teach the people of Israel, they didn't really learn it, I'm sad to say, but you and I can profit from this lesson. Look at chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, the people had just witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> Probably a miracle only second to the resurrection in all of Scripture. They had just danced and praised and declared God's goodness. They sang words like, He is my strength and my salvation. He is our king. He is our warrior. All those kinds of things. But now they're hungry, so they complain. In fact, it's interesting to me they even say that they used to sit next to meat pots and had all the bread they could eat. Well, there's, that's not true of slaves. <laughs> Remembering something better than it was. It's kind of like a lousy vacation that you tell your kids about how great it was. That's where they are. Now, it's hard to find fault with this in some ways. I mean, I'm grumpy when I'm hungry. What about you? And God doesn't find fault with them. Not at this point. He just meets their need. He, he gives them a gift. Sweet manna rains out of heaven and covers the ground. And they can take as much as they want and eat to their fill. But if you give a mouse a cookie, what happens? He's going to ask for a glass of milk. And if you give a slave some manna, he's going to want a drink of water and a taste of some quail to go along with it. And so they gripe, and they moan, and they do it over and over and over again. No matter what God provides for their physical needs, it's never enough to satisfy them. Does that sound familiar to any of you? No matter what God provides me, it's just not enough. See, dissatisfaction with what we have in this world keeps us enslaved to the world. Were you aware of that? That we feel like we don't get all the things we deserve, and so we think, and we know, by the way, the material things won't ultimately satisfy us, but we somehow think that more of what doesn't satisfy will get the job done. So if I just had more money or a bigger house or more leisure or a different spouse, or more time. And that happens when we get our eye off purpose. To be a blessing, you've got to recognize the blessings you have in your life. It's grateful people that are life-giving people. Does that make sense to you? They're able to give themselves away because they're so grateful for what they've got. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Secondhand Lions. You ever see that movie? A couple of grumpy old guys. They got more money than they know what to do with. Big old piece of property, and they're just sitting around waiting to die. Grumping and griping. Until some long-lost niece drops off her son, and they inherit this little boy that they call a weenie at the very beginning. But over time, he endears himself to them, and they embrace the purpose of raising this young boy and helping him become a man, and their lives are filled with joy. See, that's the way God created us, to be a blessing. The next lesson God wants to teach redeemed people 
is that we can learn to follow faithfully. God gives the Israelites a guidebook. It's a map for the journey, so to speak. It's called the Law of Moses or the Torah. And the Torah is an interesting word. The word in Hebrew literally means to point the finger. And it's not a finger of judgment that points at someone and says, you did the wrong thing. That's the way we tend to think of the law. But it's a finger that points the way. God's Torah was not meant to restrict his people, but to liberate him, to protect them from the choices that could steal life from them, to orient them toward values and principles that make for a just and compassionate and righteous society. That's what they were for. So giving the law was an act of grace. It's like putting up guardrails along the road in the most dangerous locations. That's what the Torah was. God asked the people to go on record and commit to trusting his way, and that's what they did in chapter 19, verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. But of course, they didn't fulfill their promise, did they? They just couldn't trust the direction of God. When things got stressful or confusing, they generally went their own way. And the result was that here are people possessing all that it is needed for life and meaning in a document that God had provided for them. And they're choosing instead to remain lost and floundering, trying to make life work their own way, even though they had the document. Again, does that sound familiar to you? Now, the document's not on stone anymore. It's written in the Scripture. And we have in the Scripture a guidebook a way of life that is successful. I've learned over the years that you show me a man who's mar whose Bible has fallen apart and his marriage probably isn't. There's something about trusting God's way. Now, I'm not a counselor, okay? If you've been counseling with me, you know that to be true. But over 35 years of being a pastor, I've had the opportunity to interact with people around their marriages. And you know, I've learned to ask one question, very first session, to ask the couple that comes to me, do you want for yourself and your family what God wants for you and for your family? Because the answer to that question determines everything about how successful we're gonna be. If the answer is yes, then there's tremendous hope. If the answer is no, really what we want is something different, then you might as well stop right there. Tolstoy said that all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its very own way. It seems to me that if you look at families that are experiencing life, they're all, they're all following the same guidebook. There's direction from the one who gives life. Okay, a third reality of the road that we can learn. No matter how far we wander, how lost we get, God constantly invites his people to seek his presence. Isn't that cool? He's never far away. God is never far away. And God taught Israel this reality with a physical reminder. It was the tabernacle. You know, the tabernacle was a tent Think of it as sort of like a portable temple. And much of Exodus is taken up, I mean, chapter after chapter, with a description of the instructions of how to build that tabernacle, that tent, how to care for it, and how to relate to it. <coughs> Pardon me. The tabernacle was set up in the middle of the camp. So in Israel camped, the tribes are all set around, and this tabernacle is right in the center of the camp, and it represented God's presence among his people. 
became a guide. Exodus 40 shows us how that worked, verse 34. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tent or the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out and follow the cloud. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day when it was taken up. So this cloud would move. And as the cloud came up out of the tabernacle and moved, the people would say, time to pack up the tent, let's go. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. The presence of God was constantly obvious to comfort and guide his people. And this wasn't a casual presence. This was a holy presence. You know, the Bible tells us that when Jesus was on earth, here's how John says it. The word became flesh and pitched its tent among us. Tabernacled is the word. <laughs> Jesus was a temple of the word, the Holy Spirit. He tabernacled the presence of God in a tent of flesh. And when he ascended into heaven after the resurrection, he promised that he would be with us in that way, even to the end of the age. And how does that happen? The Holy Spirit, when we come to know Jesus Christ, enters our life and sets up residence there. And not just in each of us as individuals, but the church. The church, not the organization, but the people. We're we're the temple of God. Are you aware of that? We're the tabernacle. We are the place where God's presence resides. Do you know what a resource that is? Spirit-filled relationships with covenant people that we know love Jesus, that is so important in our lives. And Boy, if you haven't recognized that over this COVID thing, we've been so isolated. There's so many of us have fallen back into traps and things that we hadn't done for such a long time. And you know why? Because we need the tabernacle. We need one another. We need to be with other life-giving spirits where the Spirit of God is in them and we sense God's presence. Where do I go when I need to experience the presence of God? Well, I come to you. Because that's where the Spirit is. That's why we press small groups and covenant relationships and friendships with other followers of Christ. Because you, you become like who you hang with, don't you? In the wilderness, we've got to hang together. Okay, one more reality of the road. Because of our new identity, because of God's provision because of his guidance, because of his presence, you and I can learn to live as a kingdom of priests, bringing honor to Christ and blessing to every Alaskan and the world beyond. We can. Israel never learned to do it, but we can, because God's purpose has not changed. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter writes this to us. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then later, a few verses later, you are a chosen race. Familiar language? A royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, when we first outlined the series called The Road Out, today's message was 
It's supposed to be about living in God's provision. As I studied this story, I realized that man is a great provision. Water is a great provision. The law is a great provision. But the greatest provision that God gives his people is a new identity. We are brand new. That's why Paul can write, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. It is no longer my life for God. It is God's life in me. It is not about me for Jesus. It is about Jesus in me for the world. When we live in that, we experience wonder in the adventure. We're not the people we used to be. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. The old has passed. The old has passed away. What do we say when people die? Oh, they passed away. The old is dead. The new is alive. Everything about our success in living between the now and the not yet, as we navigate a broken world, as we proclaim Christ's excellencies, everything about our success in that depends on whether or not we believe we're new people. Do you believe you're new people? See, if you're new people, that means there's no guilt or shame from the past to hinder you. That's passed away. And if you're new people in Jesus, then you don't have any fear about what's coming down the road. So it seems to me that you can live in the moment and be a blessing to the nations, can't you? God calls that the church. Well, here's my pastor's challenge. I want you to think for a moment of a challenge you currently face in your life. It could be at work, it could be at home, it could be at school with friends or family. Just take just a moment, close your eyes if you have to, and think of that challenge. Get it on the front of your brain. And I have a couple of questions for you. First, how might God be using that challenge to teach you how to trust him gratefully and follow him faithfully? and seek his presence. What might God want to be doing in that challenge to teach you to gratefully trust him, to faithfully follow him, and to seek after him and not something else? And then secondly, what will it, what will it look like for you to represent Jesus as a priest in the circumstances of your life and the challenges you face? What would the job of a priest be in that challenge, connecting God with people and people with God. That's the story of the Exodus. It's our story too. Pray with me. Lord, I'm grateful for the opportunity just to share my heart and share the story and would ask you that for me, for my family, and for the people here whom I love, my spiritual family, that somehow you'd give us a renewed understanding of exactly who we are to you, a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy people, called to be a blessing to those around us, that every place, Lord, where we've become obstinate or angry or narrow, demanding, accusing, all those things. Lord, we repent of them. We want to be like you. We want to show the world what it means to walk without fear, following a living hope whose presence is real and powerful 
It releases us from slavery. That's what we long to do, and I pray that for myself and for everyone else who hears my voice today. In Jesus' name, amen.